Hey everyone, in this episode, we cover a lot of different aspects with regards to software, but mostly how it's never actually finished. It's an organism and it always kind of keeps evolving. Today's guest is someone who you might know and is currently developer evangelist over at honeycomb.io, Jessica Kerr. Don't forget to like and subscribe when you're on YouTube and follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Enjoy. Welcome to Beyond Coding, a dive into the world of successful people in IT. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. Here's your host, Patrick Akil. Hey Jess, how's it going? Hey Patrick, <laughs> it's, it's a good day. Yeah. How are you? I'm, I'm very good. I think it's a, a bit earlier for you than it is for us, uh, but I'm very happy to have you on. Thanks. So I invited you on to talk about, well, first of all, software, uh, but second, how it's never done, right? We're always mm. working on something. We're always continuously improving on it, but software is- Or we should be. Or, or we should be, right? Uh, but software is, I think, unique in the, in the way that it's never done. Uh, but could you uh, explain to us why it might never be done in the first place? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the uniqueness of software is, is that we can continue to change it after we build it, unlike- yeah like uh, anything that you package up and ship. Um, but software is never done because, I mean, on one hand, you might think, well, there's always more we could add. Yeah. And, and that's often true. But at some point, you get to a point where, from your perspective, it's totally good enough yeah. and it's time to move on to something else. Uh, but software, it doesn't exist in isolation. Uh, whatever you write is interacting with other pieces of software and with people um, at some level, either developers or uh, like direct human users. Yeah. And so the software is embedded in the world around it and it has to be compatible with the world around it. And that world is changing. Mm. Um, so the, the software that you interact with is probably evolving and changing yeah. uh, the, the people that interact with your software, their expectations are changing. Yeah. Oh, oh, my, my kid hit a website. She was looking for custom clown shoes uh, for a Christmas present. And she found this website and she's, she's looking at it. And um, she's like, I don't know, mom, this is sus. Is, is this a real site? <laughs> yeah. And I looked at it and I'm like, oh yeah, that is like total state of the art late nineties. Yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. A, a legit vintage website would order cloud shoes from them. <laughs> <laughs> so the yeah. expectations of people change and what is seen as like acceptable alters. Yeah. And then finally, the, the total easy one is security. Mm. Um, because vulnerabilities uh, are a function of the world and what people have figured out how to do. Yeah. So Log4j was perfectly fine until somebody figured out that they could send JNDI colon um, whatever and uh, get some software to hit their website and pull down and execute a shell script. Yeah. Um, and so that vulnerability didn't exist in the world until somebody figured it out. The potential was there in the software, but that but it was <laughs> but those libraries that are perfectly safe aren't yeah. after the world changes outside. Interesting. Uh, my buddy, yeah, so that, that, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> my buddy, uh, Jethro, he, he says software is kind of like an organism, right? And it starts small in, in kind of an infancy, uh, and it might grow an arm or two extra all of a sudden, <laughs> which, which you, you don't really expect. Uh, That's true. And yeah. you would like to remove that arm, but no, that hand is shaking hands with some other piece of software that expects those 17 fingers. Exactly. Yeah, and it really, really just shows how it should evolve like everything else that's around it, exactly like you said, right? Because the world around it is evolving. It needs to evolve with it. Otherwise, right. it'll become extinct, right? And something else will take its place. Um, yeah, either extinct or pathological. Yeah. What do, what and do you the mean rest of the world will... Well, like that when, when you get a piece of, you might say, legacy software yeah. that's running and is useful, I, I want to say PayPal, Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I, I haven't dealt with it myself, but I've heard yeah. that the PayPal interact API is really difficult to, uh, implement and interact with. Interesting. Um, 
but again, it's it's going to be hampered by that backwards compatibility. Yeah. Um, because it was first, right? PayPal was the first uh, really big yeah. um, pay online with this um, online currency, well, online bank account thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's got backwards compatibility and whatever other internal hindrances prevent <laughs> the API from improving. Um, and yet people bend over backwards to interact with it anyway, yeah. or more likely um, pay a third party service to interact with it for them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so that's what I meant by uh, pathological, by you become a difficulty in the world. Exactly. Right. And I think it's, it's very difficult for, I mean, PayPal is a great example of the companies that are trailblazing, right? Because those usually mm-hmm. get passed up uh, by those that have learned. Yeah, exactly. By those that have learned from oh, right. that go before them. Right? You learn yeah. the software around you. You learn from your competitors uh, and you try and do it yeah. either better than them or, or in a different way. Yeah. 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 So PayPal having established yeah. that um, this online currency exchange uh, API is a thing, yeah. um, then there are, you know, the Stripe API is way better and um, probably Apple and Google Pay are probably easier to interact with because then that becomes a competition point for yeah. the newcomer. Exactly. That's, that's, that can also distinguish you uh, from the available options in that way as well. But- right. And meanwhile, PayPal is, um, I mean, even if they have the resources and the product skills and the like, the, the internal politically political ability uh, to improve that API or yeah. offer a new version, they're still like stuck supporting the old API. And that yeah. is like a, that's your, your code is a liability, um, but not just the code. It's, it's the connections to everyone else who's shaking the hand of the extra arm yeah. um, that they're saddled with. Exactly. It's one reason startups can move so fast because no one uses them. Yeah, no dependencies. Yeah. And no one depending on them. Exactly. But then I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I'm, I'm very solution oriented, but I can't really imagine a solution for then, let's say, PayPal, right? Because you do have those external dependencies or, or people that are mm-hmm. dependent on you, uh, those extra mm-hmm. arms, which people just shake hands with. Uh, you're not going to cut them off, right? Because those those people are either dependent on you or you're dependent on them. That's your lifeblood. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's I mean, I mean, they're dependent on your API the way it is, yeah. and you're dependent on their their money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's it's true. How how would you solve that then? Are you going to start again, or, or are you going to be like, well, this part has become legacy. We're going to build something next to it, and we're going to transition. And then even yeah. is it going to be cost effective? Um, I mean, if you, if, if people, it, PayPal has so much power in this market, I mean, I doubt they'll bother, but <laughs> you can produce a second API alternative, Yeah. deprecate the first one, but continue to support it forever. Mm. Uh, meanwhile, letting new integrations use an API that it's worth it to them to use. Exactly. But, and then you're maintaining too. And yeah, you're just maintaining you or maintaining too. This is like the disrupt yourself technique yeah. where you, you build like an internally competitive API where it's mm. not really competitive because you get the money either way. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but the idea being you want this new API to be so good that it puts the old one out of business. Exactly. So it can evolve into the future more easily than the old one, right? With the, right. With the kind of deprecated right. dependencies in a way. Yeah. A consciously designed API. Yeah. Do you think software is is always destined to kind of become legacy at some point in that way as well? Oh, okay. That's an interesting question. Yeah. So, so people argue over the definition of legacy software. Yeah. Um, Michael Feathers is like it's software without tests. Mm. Uh, in the past, I've been like, it's software that's not alive in anyone's heads. Yeah. And. Uh, that's closer, but really legacy is not a property of the software. Legacy is the property of the relationship mm. between the software and whoever's trying to use it yeah. or change it or interact with it. I mean, if if you join a, join a company yeah. um, and you start working on software you've never seen before, to you, that's legacy. Mm. I mean, it may seem uh, it's a lot it may not feel too much like legacy if you've got a team around you that can show you around. Yeah. 
if it's undergoing change. So, and, and that becomes the hardest challenge of uh, figuring out what it's doing while it's changing instead yep. of figuring out what it's doing ever. Um, <laughs> if it's in a modern language, it feels less legacy. Uh, but that, but modern is a, a, what's a modern language is a function of a person. Exactly. Um, what they're used to, what they've experienced in the past and, and even their personal preference in a way as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a relationship. Um, and you can, you can take a code base that anyone would consider legacy because there's, there's no one, anyone in the company, mm -hmm. because there's no one in the company who understands it anymore. Um, and uh, you can like bring it out of that languor yeah. by becoming familiar with it if it's small enough for that to happen. Yeah. Uh, Cause the other, the other qualification uh, when we use the mm -hmm. word legacy, um, this also implies that it's a money-making software, that this, this is useful software. Yeah. It's in production and people are using it and all its all its hands, no, no. Some of its hands are being shaken. We don't know which ones. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's at least not useful, yeah. Right, right. So that's why I much prefer working on legacy software mm. to anything Greenfield because legacy is inherently useful and most new projects will never see the light or, yeah. or um, reach the status of legacy. That's a, that's a good way of putting it, right? As, as long as it's delivering value, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be more fun to work on, probably. Uh, and even it's within Greenfield, if it doesn't actually deliver that value to your end customer, right? If you never go live, um, does that mean it's, it's not legacy? I think it is becoming legacy real quick if it doesn't deliver that value anyway. Oh, oh um, that's a good point. Um, so, uh, well, I think... By legacy, we mean code that we choose not to throw away. Mm. Um, so that usually that means it's delivering value, it's in production, yeah. um, and it's it's intertwined with various other systems or people's expectations, um, which is a big obstacle to change. Yeah. Um, but it could also be that <laughs> you're stuck with this legacy software because someone thinks this IP has value. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I think they're probably wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that, that value can exist just in someone's head. Yeah. And if that uh, person is powerful, then <laughs> it can be a sunken cost, right? And a, and a fallacy yeah. in that it might still be valuable. Um, right. And that it's, it's sometimes really hard to get out of, right? You notice that within organizations mm -hmm. uh, or even yeah. as engineer, when you, when you're working on something and you just keep digging deeper and you're like, man, I really hope it's going to end soon. Uh, and it, it might not be basically, you don't know yet. It's hard to let go of that. Yeah. I think yeah. it is, it is. And yeah, especially when, when people have, you know, dedicated years of their life to developing this code and maybe there's some fancy automation tool that's very generic and we're just using this, this one aspect of it is still in the flow. Yeah. And then you've got this whole wad of abstraction. Yeah. I'm really just thinking about kind of the software life cycle, right? Uh, and I think e-commerce is a great example of that in that I'm a, I'm a consultant and I've done a lot of projects with regards to kind of rebuilding, revamping either an e-commerce project or a product uh, or a part of it, right? Because a business need is there. It needs to evolve mm -hmm. faster than what it's already doing. Uh, and apparently the old software can handle it, cannot really handle it. They don't even know most of the time. Uh, but there's a project to start something new all of a sudden. Uh, and then it becomes kind of an arms race versus the the old versus the new in a way. Um, but I think Are you it's, trying to reach feature parity? Yeah, I, I don't even know what the main goal is, but there's been, <laughs> there, there's a lot of rebuilding going on. And sometimes I don't even know why, right? Because I feel mm. like it might even be more cost effective to really optimize what you have in the first place. Really hit that wall first and be like, okay, this is the part that needs optimization. Instead of being like, we can't do this, we need to start again, start before even going live, and then do kind of a big bang transition. Oh God, yeah, yeah, because because you think, you look at a pile of code, yeah. and you're like, oh, we could rewrite this. Yeah. Um, but there's more, there's more to replacing software than rewriting it. Mm -hmm. You could have a new wad of code that you think does everything this one does, yeah. but can you like rewire all those connections and have them work? You don't know what all the, the 
uh, people in software who depend on your software are expecting. Exactly. Um, some of those may be documented in tests, and yep. that can help a lot, but there's always unexpected ones. Um, and generally, when you rewrite something, you want to improve it in some ways, which may be an improvement from your perspective, but maybe not from people who've been trained in the old software yeah. and don't want to spend their day figuring out a new way to do it. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Yeah, that, that, the migration is much bigger, much, much bigger deal than people. Yeah. Uh, Yet to me, it, it feels like organizations really, maybe it's it's the field I'm in, but I feel like they opt more for the migration or the rewrite uh, or starting from scratch rather than optimizing what they already have, right? Really just mm -hmm. uh, churning out the value in, in what they already have. I don't know if it's I a budget thing or, but I don't know why that choice is always oh. there. Okay. Yeah. I've got a couple of theories. Yeah. One is we choose the problem we don't know over the problem we do. Interesting. <laughs> Right. Because yeah. because when you're considering how do we make this software uh, faster or smoother or whatever it is that yeah. you need, um, there's kind of you know, it's hard mm -hmm. because you've tried and it's hard. Yeah. Whereas rewriting, it seems easy. Yeah. Um, but software has a coastline problem. Um, there's there's this property of coastlines mm. that if you like you like look at a, a map of the globe or something yep. and you try to to measure the coastline of England, um, you can draw a line on it and find the the length of that or a line around it and find the length of that line. But yep. then if you zoom in to a map of just Europe and you draw a line around England and it's a little higher level of detail, your line will be longer. Yeah. And the farther you zoom in toward the coast as you trace it, the longer the line gets and it does not converge. <laughs> yeah. There is no definitive length of that coastline. It's always a function of how far away you are. And the closer in you get, the longer it is. Software is like that. At a high level, that rewrite is like that little blob outline of England, and it seems perfectly approachable. Yeah. But as you zoom in, um, as you get down into the details of every interface um, and every function and every test, um, it gets longer. Yeah. Just the, the problem gets sometimes harder, sometimes just more arcane, especially yeah. when it's an interface. <clears throat> um, so, so when you're considering rewrite versus um, revamp, yeah, um, you you can see all the wiggly, painful coastline in the revamp, but the rewrite, you're way zoomed out, and it looks simpler. Yeah, I really like that yes. analogy. I, I really think that's a, that's a good theory in, in why it's easier. I think it also explains kind of what we were talking about earlier, right? If you actually start with that rewrite, uh, you actually okay. try and, and build it up, make it exactly or, or better than what you already have. You go into kind of a sunken cost of like, man, this might be more complex. There might be a longer line that we didn't expect, right? It's, it's going to be never ending, uh, never converging in a way, and which might some result- some point you declare it close enough. Exactly. But... Which either, and then you have migration uh, problems. Yeah. It, I mean, it might result into going live kind of subpar, right? But that kind of defeats the purpose of the rewrite in the first place. Or mm -hmm. you're like, man, we're never going to go live with this. There, there needs to be so much done. Uh, we might be better off with what we already have. And then you're still going to revamp kind of. Yeah. And maybe learn something. I mean, honestly, yep. if I were advising, if I were like a advising a, a VP or an executive who's choosing revamp or rewrite, yep. I'd be like, how much money do we have? Mm. Can we do both? Both. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Can we do both? I mean, that's not efficient yeah. money wise, but it's going to get you the best result, period. I love that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Man, that's a good question. The next time it pops up, I, I will definitely keep that in mind, right? Might not be the most cost efficient, but then also... We can immediately. It doesn't look the most cost efficient. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it turns exactly. out to be a lot more cost efficient than only working on the rewrite and then throwing it away two years later. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, short term, right? People always think short term. What What is the most cost efficient short term? And that for sure is right. not going to be the most cost efficient short term, except when you look at the quality of your output, right? That's always long term. Uh, needs to be kind of longevity software. It's, yeah. It always needs that longevity. So you need to figure out which option is the best. And the way you can do that is by doing both and then seeing the yes. result of that. And then you get the best result regardless. Yeah. Well, hypothetically, there are political issues there, <laughs> but you, yeah. you at least have the potential to really evaluate the results and see which is better. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what biology does. Mm. 
that's like, what's the most efficient pathway to this? Let's do all of them. Yeah. I love that answer. I mean, on a smaller scale, we know how to do that, right? As engineers, we're like, we'll do a proof of concept of, of multiple options that we have. We'll boil it down. We now have three options. Let's try it out. And we pick based on that. But because the scale is, is so much bigger, man, it didn't even cross my mind that that's an option, right? If there's right. an event where we write, I'm like, man, this is a hard decision. But if you spin that around, if you make it small enough, why not try both, right? Learn from that that's true. and take that yeah, with you. Yeah, you, you can try both for three months yeah. and see what you've learned after three months. And then maybe you continue with both or maybe not. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, I think, point. I think, I think duplication of effort is highly underrated in software currently. Mm. What do you mean by I that? Mean, so, I, I mean that letting people do the same thing in different ways. Yeah. This is how real life works. It's yeah. how the world works outside of your single company. Yeah. It's how things get done in nature, both like social, um, human nature kind of thing mm -hmm. and in biology. Um, and yet we seem to think in a single company, it's a problem if two teams are separately uh, building a little service that lets them log. Yeah. Um, uh, instead of just one team doing it and the other team doing something else. Instead of one team doing it and the other team waiting. Yeah. Or, or uh, worse, a centralized team created in order to do that so that they can do this for a month and then abandon it and then it's no belongs to nobody. <laughs> and yeah, um, it just, it just. The world does not end if you have two pieces of different code that do the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. At some point, at some point, maybe um, this this piece of code becomes more important than you thought, and you're you find yourself adding the same features. Those teams should totally be talking to each other. Yeah, for sure. And sharing knowledge, but they don't need to share code because sharing code is coupling, and coupling is all those handshakes yeah. that forces you to keep the seventeen fingered arm. Exactly becomes that big ball of mess. I, I, I'm really enjoying this analogy. <laughs> yeah, the, the organism. <laughs> I love it as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know how it evolved into that, right? But we want to be as efficient as possible with the resources we have. And that has a, a real short mi mindset, basically. Short term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing about efficiency and, and um, how it's evolved through manufacturing and how we've gotten good at efficiency, yeah. we can become very efficient at doing the same thing over and over. Exactly. And when you are doing the same thing over and over, then you should focus on efficiency because you know how to do the thing. Yeah. And now you can think about how to do the thing cheaper or faster or smoother. Or, well, no, you'd probably, well, smoother first. <laughs> but, um, smoother so that it can get cheaper or faster. Exactly. Um, but in software, we're never doing the same thing over and over. Yeah, that's a good we, point. When we do, we automate it. So we, and, and then poof, that's efficient. Yeah. Uh, but software is all about creating something that does not yet exist in the world. Exactly. Okay. Sometimes it's something that does exist in the world, but in a different programming language. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a rewrite. <laughs> which, exactly. Which, yeah, yeah I, I, I again think it's overrated. But even then, when we're doing it in a new programming language, this is a different problem. Yeah. This is a different thing. This is a different coastline we're mapping. Yeah, it is not the same. Um, so yeah, I think I think efficiency as a focus in software is incredibly expensive. Yeah, it leads us down all kinds of rat holes because those two teams that each need their front end to be able to to send a log message. Um, if you, if you say, okay, you can build one, but it has to work for the whole company or at least the whole division, yeah. it's never going to happen. You just killed it. Yeah. I mean, if it's going to happen, it's going to cost six times as much where you could have built two, yeah. each of which works only for one team for twice as much. Yeah. I Probably know. less if they talk to each other. <laughs> exactly. I don't know how we, how we got here, right. As organizations that, that really that fixated mindset on efficiency. I do think it's evolving though, right? We've already seen mm -hmm. kind of the yeah. benefits of pair programming. I think it's easier to do and, and kind of advocate for. I'm a big fan of kind of those co-creation patterns. Uh, yeah, but if you the boil it down, programming even better. Exactly. If you boil it down black and white, it doesn't sound as efficient, right? Two people working on the same thing. Aren't they better if off doing some things? Our work is typing. Yeah. Then it's not efficient, but our work is making decisions. Exactly. 
Right. And decisions are limited on knowledge, yep. not time. So the question is, how much knowledge do we have focused on this problem? Exactly. And even that knowledge can differ from person to person, right? Exactly. If you think it should work like A, and I think it should work like B, there might be a gap in there, which is going to cost you down the line as well. If we can mm -hmm. that communication yeah. while we're working on implementing A and B, could even be C, right? And then we choose right. and we're right. the we best one it. is C. Basically, the only way we can do that is by communicating uh, and the best communication is direct, I think, rather than going through a pull request and a different, different oh, method no, of communicating. No. And yeah. Yeah. The best communication, in fact, the way we pass know-how isn't even by talking to us directly. It's by doing some work together. Yeah. It's really just converging those ideas in the moment uh, and mm -hmm. having those conversations when they arise. Yeah, those ideas and uh, little pieces of knowledge, like the trivia of how various interfaces work and various language features and all those things that interact. Yeah. If we can, if we can combine that in one smooth flow. Also, if you do ensemble programming and the whole team is working on a thing together, yeah. you never have merge conflicts. <laughs> when you when you say ensemble prog programming, should I think about mob programming or is it slightly yeah. different? Yeah, ensemble is a nicer word for mob yeah. programming. Yeah, I like that word as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan. I mean, I, I talked talk to Dragan about this, uh, Dragan Stefanovic, and he really says, right, a lot of side effects are already great. One of the big, biggest ones that stood out to me is that shared mental model, right? Knowing what you're building, kind of figuring out, okay, this is really how it works. Uh, instead of me building a, a feature, for example, for billing, and you're never going to touch that code uh, either until I'm gone or you, until you have the next feature that you need to build on top of it. And then there's so Which much time and kind of, exactly. And then there's so much time and kind of figuring out how, how, do this, how does this even work? Or maybe I should have mm -hmm. done it differently, or, or I think they should have done it differently. Uh, yeah, or which parts are load bearing and which yeah, parts are safe to change. Exactly right, especially if you don't have unit tests. I'm I'm really glad that testing is is now a first class citizen. I mean, at least mm. in the projects that I'm in, because I wouldn't want to be in a project where there's not a lot of unit tests. Right, you don't want to be able to tear down a wall and it be a load bearing role, as as you said. Right, right, right. I like how GPod describes the the unit test as part of the scaffolding. Yeah. <laughs> My Part of the scaffolding. <laughs> yeah. Um, that you build around the program in order to build the software. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of like if, if you're building an organism, mm -hmm. you first build like its cocoon or or womb or incubation tank yeah. or whatever you want. <laughs> you build that, right? And then you build the organism. And it, it feels inefficient because every piece of software is new and different. Yeah. Therefore, this scaffolding will only be used for this one piece of software. Yeah. But we, we continue to use it for this piece of software. And it's it's essential. It's what keeps our software healthy. It what keep, it's what keeps us able to work in it. Yeah. Uh, so another thing that's undervalued is non-production code mm. in the sense of the scaffolding that lets us work safely. Yeah. That really, I mean, that's first and foremost within the engineering experience, right? If it's not in production mm -hmm. necessarily, but the engineers do benefit from it, that's probably mm -hmm. gonna make them more effective, right? Not necessarily efficient, uh, but definitely more effective. And I right, think- Right, right, efficiency is all how you measure it. <laughs> exactly. I can make it seem very good depending on how I measure it, like like with exactly. all things. Um, but I think effective developers are, are definitely more happier, right? And I think- Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, there's such a good correlation yeah. in our observation between um, being able to get stuff done and really ship stuff in production and make uh, the people who use it happy and generate revenue for the company. Developers love having impact yeah. and so much so that developer happiness becomes is a pretty darn good proxy yeah. for effectiveness. Exactly. So even though effectiveness is really hard to measure, if you measure developer happiness, yeah. And don't try to try to like rig it with ping pong tables or something dumb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, then uh, yeah, so uh, like Doc Norton talks about, I think it was at Groupon, mm. um, uh, to to measure code quality in order to improve code quality. Yeah. He uh, had a Git plugin or something that um, asked people every time they made a commit, um, "How do you feel about this code?" 
Okay. On a scale of one to five, from sad to happy. Yeah. Um, and that is a really good proxy for code quality. Yeah. Because then I, I think developers would be more happy, which would mean that the quality would be better. Is that what, what kind of the outcome was? Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. And when we started measuring that, then um, uh, you could see which teams yeah. um, were unhappy with their code. And you could talk to them and say, like, yeah, yeah, our manager is super pressuring us to just slam these tickets out. Yeah. And, and when you do that, you you hit that asymptote of harder to change, harder to change, harder to change, can't change it. Yeah, exactly. Just months for a single change and then it, it, and, and all the hot fixes and integration problems that it has. Yeah. And that's and, and then then it's definitely legacy. That's, <laughs> that's... definitely because you can't change it. Exactly. Then then you're too late, basically. But man, that's a, such a simple way of measuring code quality. I think it's. We always figure, I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to measure, stuff like that. Uh, but just a, a how happy are you with the code you've changed uh, it's or the code you've just... It's a useful proxy. Exactly, right? It, sounds, it seems very applicable as well. I might try that out. Yeah. Cool. I'm wondering what it would be within our team, actually. But yeah, let's see. What were we talking about? Kind of a general proxy for happiness. Yeah, I think, I mean, you mentioned those, those ping pong tables. I think they help, right, to a certain degree. But a lot of time, you're still touching code, right? That's that's kind of the uh, the meat and bones of what you do as an engineer. Um, yeah, so that and that's the biggest experience. thing exactly. for your happiness. Yeah. Yeah. So that engineering it's like, it's experience. It's the environment you work in. <laughs> Sorry about that. So so that oh, engineering ahead. experience is is really just if it's not optimized, people are not going to be happy, right? And then the code quality suffers because of that. Yeah. 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 And it means it means not always aiming for impact yeah. or activity, whichever it is that your company obsesses over activity would be like how many tickets are being closed, yeah. how many commits are made. Um, impact would be like whatever metrics we're looking at for clicks or interactions <laughs> or sales or whatever, Exactly. Um, which is a little better than measuring activity. But, uh, um, but even, even impact, we should focus on only some percentage of the time. Yeah. Maybe, maybe as high as 80%. Yeah. But if you always prioritize the same thing, you'll miss so many opportunities. There was a, someone said to me the other day about Christmas, the, like the, the week or two around Christmas. Yeah. Product owners are away, so the devs will play. Really? Meaning, yeah, yeah. And they're yeah. talking about like uh, implementing observability across asynchronous events. Yeah. And these are the kind of things that you can't say what the impact will be. Yeah. But 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 there's a very high chance that it'll help a little and a pretty decent chance that it'll help a ton. Exactly. And like change, yeah, change your workflow and make everything tremendously more efficient in the future. But you can't say for sure and you can't say <laughs> which thing yeah. will get tremendously more efficient. So you can't build a business case for it. Yeah. But if for 20% of your time or whatever, you focus on what developers think need done, yeah. then you'll get some of those. Just switching prioritization schemes um, lets, lets you uh, get things done that have a breadth of impact. Yeah. So the developer-focused things have a specific impact from a developer perspective, yeah. but a broad dispersed impact from uh, a business impact perspective. Exactly. Um, but it winds up being tremendous. So like there's this thing that if you optimize for one thing all the time, that's definitely not optimal, <laughs> even for that one thing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You're missing those, 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 whoops, the broad structural changes that can make a lot of difference. Yeah, that makes sense, right? I mean, the reason, uh, I mean, how we got here is, is software is never done, right? We const continuously mm -hmm. need to evolve because the world around us is evolving. Well, the same can be said for kind of that internal quality, right? That real engineers yeah. that touch the code that they face, right? If you're not evolving with the environment in that way, then that part becomes legacy, which in turn probably makes your product more slow uh, and in turn mm. makes that, might make that legacy as well. So really, I, I love the kind of horizontal as axis uh, of continuously mm. evolving in, in all aspects, right? Uh, might change right. your percentage here or there. Uh, but I think that continuous part is very important there because otherwise you're going to be playing catch up. And I think catch up is, is really hard to sell, for example, to your product owner. If you're like, well, 
we're not actually going to deliver any value because we, re we really need this. We've been pushing it back, right? And that already is not a good sign. And, and then, again, if, if your product owner only had Dominion yeah. 10 months out of the year or whatever, yeah. then you wouldn't have to fight for the things you know need done. Exactly. Yeah. Because, yeah, it is hard to sell to someone that it's not for. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's not your customer. Yeah. Right. But but we're changing the, the structure, the scaffolding um, or the internals of our software yeah. to be able to do more things, to be able to change. And I think that is the, the, the real um, definition of legacy is software that has value, but you can't change it. Yeah. And and, and you is specific in that. So mm -hmm. what's legacy to you might not be legacy to me. Exactly. If I'm familiar with it. Uh, so familiar with it that I can comfortably change it. Yeah, it has a perspective aspect. Yeah. I think yeah. back to kind of that, that product team, right? And and let's say it's it's very easily structured in that you have a product owner uh, and kind of a team, right? I think mm -hmm. the accountability for the product, right, the internal quality uh, is usually associated to the people that are knowledgeable about that, that are really hands-on about that, right? Mm -hmm. And then the yeah, value of the be. features and, and kind of the product in and of itself uh, is mostly product owner uh, plus a lot of stakeholders, well, we, right? We proxy it through I, the product owner. Exactly. We pretend that, that one person can represent all the external stakeholders. Exactly. It would be it's, it's much better when your your team is small enough and close enough to the customer that they can interact directly. Yeah. Um, like at Honeycomb, um, there's a there's a Honeycomb pollinator Slack where a lot of people who use Honeycomb come in and talk about it, and our engineers are directly in there too. Yeah. Uh, so there's direct interaction with customers, which is a lot better. And yep. meanwhile, you've, we, we do have product people, um, to like, uh, refine, uh, the, what we're going to implement next and make sure exactly. it's, um, it's, it's like broken down stuff. into kind of easily digestible pieces in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Yes. And we don't implement a little bit here and there and a little bit here and there and a little <laughs> bit here and there, but we draw that into, um, yeah. a more comprehensive, uh, conceptually solid, solution yeah. which then becomes evolvable in the future much more than you know we didn't add an arm we added a finger and a thumb <laughs> exactly it can't grab yet basically but i think <laughs> it can't grab yet. exactly <laughs> i completely agree with what you said in that i think the engineering side should come closer to that customer right as close as possible ideally yeah exactly really just get that that feedback from the actual people that use it but i think in the other way around i think that might also be beneficial not necessarily customers, but that business proxy we talked about, the product owner, I think mm -hmm. it's better if they also kind of understand a little bit of what the engineering experience is like, right? And if yeah, you can if, have if that. they're in the mob. Exactly. If they're in the mob, they get the engineers or the ensemble. Yeah. They get the engineering yeah. perspective. They see, they, they feel the pain with people yeah. and they're right there with their knowledge exactly. of why we're doing this, yeah. which helps tremendously. Yeah. Exactly. And I think it, First of all, it increases awareness, um, mm -hmm. and awareness probably will also increase the accountability, right? Then you really have that shared ownership, I think, of what you're building and also whom you're building it for, right? Both as mm -hmm. engineers as well as kind of the business proxy for the customer in that way. Uh, and I think shared ownership is best, right? Because then when you have to advocate for some kind of catch up, right, even though it should have already been innate in the work that you're doing, it's more easily understandable why that is required, right? Why it's more of a long-term game, right? A long-term mindset mm -hmm. versus that short-term efficiency we already talked about. Because that's, yeah. I think, the, the game that wins until the end. Uh, because at some point, I mean, software is going to stagnate, right? Your velocity is going to stagnate. It's really just a game of uh, pushing that as far into the future as possible, I feel like. Yeah, and, and in some ways, when we talk about like documentation and good tests and yep. stuff, you can kind of set up future you to be able to get back into the context of being able to change it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the context. Yeah. But then again, you don't want to think about that long term until the software has value. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's step number one, right? Realizing kind of that value, getting live in the first place, right? Because if you're not yeah. live, then uh, uh, there's no value at all yet. Um, mm -hmm. And then just continuously improving, building in that quality as you go, uh, rather than playing catch up because that's uh, I, it's hard to sell. You shouldn't sell it in the first place, um, and it should already be right. there. But if you can say that everything we do will leave the code a little bit better, yeah, exactly. Just need a little bit of time right. for that. It'll be better at the end. 
Yeah. You mentioned the software life cycle mm. earlier. And the key about the software life cycle is the end is out of production. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really long. But exactly. in, at the same time, you have smaller cycles inside it, cycles of uh, delivery. Yeah. Um, and it turn, there, there are cycles of feature delivery, which, um, which have a release n- near the end. There's all, you always need to do a couple little iterations. But, yeah. um, and then there's cycle of um, code delivery, which should be much smaller. Yeah. If, if you have like feature flags and can gate your, uh, gate your new code behind them. Yeah. Um, and the smaller you can make those cycles, the better. Exactly. So even though you recognize that the whole life cycle is huge and may outlive you even if it's really good, yeah. um, the the smaller we can make our, our day-to-day work cycles, the better. Yeah. I mean, the, the smaller you make it, the faster the feedback, right? You might have yes. made a feature that's incorrect, right? Or a test fails or uh, a user uses it in the way that you didn't imagine, right? You need to kind of accommodate for that. And the best way to do that is get that feedback. Uh, First of all, have the Mm -hmm. visibility and the communication in place uh, and then adjust for it. And the observability to notice when the customer uses it in a way you didn't imagine. Most people don't have that kind of uh, lens into production um, that observability gives you so that after you, you release the feature, you can go back and look at what are people really doing? Where are they getting hung up? Which validation is confusing them and they give up and go buy it somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah. And I really like how this conversation went from kind of software is never done in, in kind of forming that organism analogy uh, and how we kind of stuck with it towards the end, right? Really just about delivering value and, and kind of having that long-term mindset also in, in the way that you act as an engineer uh, and also hopefully how a company evolves um, within its mindset. Is there anything that's kind of missing within that picture you feel like? Um. Oh, lots. And we get to learn it all the time, which is fun. Uh, But I really appreciate the organism analogy because I do think that at the point we are with software, we're we're writing code to execute in a runtime as part of it, as part of a software system that's part of a wider ecosystem, that's part of the whole world. Uh, What we do is more analogous to biology than it is to physics. I agree. Yeah, it used to be more about physics. It used to be about electrical engineering, about can you get the computer to do this logical, solve yeah. this logic problem for you. Exactly. Um, and and now it's much more about the interactions. Yeah, we've, we've evolved beyond that, right? It's no longer that black and white, right? There's always trade-off. Yeah. There's always options. Yeah. It's uh, no longer that easy. Yeah. <laughs> and it was never easy, yeah, exactly. but it was a different kind of hard. <laughs> But luckily, it brings a lot of new possibilities and a lot of new enjoyments as well. I mean, that's probably why we're still doing this, yeah, which is yeah, awesome as well. Happy surprises. Yeah. Of, of when I was in retail, it was the store manager did what? <laughs> <laughs> Always a fun game. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I really want to thank you for coming on, Jessica. I, uh, I had a lot you. of fun. This was great. Yeah, right. I, uh, I hope we can do this again sometime. I'd love to. Yeah. Maybe even in, in person, but I, I mean, the huge TV works as well. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again for coming on. Jessica thanks Kerr, so everyone, you. hit her up on, uh, or check her out on Twitter. It's, it's Jessitron. Uh, I think it's Jessitron everywhere, right? Yeah, Jessitron.com. Jessitron.com, for I sure. Mean, I think on Instagram is Jessitronica but, yeah. and Twitch. Awesome. Twitch as well. Nice. I'll check that out as well. Cool. Jessica Kerr, everyone. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. 